Linux Out Loud is firing up our mics, connecting those headphones as we search the community for themes to expand upon. We keep the banter friendly, the conversation somewhat on topic, and have fun doing it. This week, we're spouting off about our Linux workflows. Let's get into episode 64. Linux Out Loud is brought to you by Linode and Bitwarden. We are short a co-host today. Something happened to Nate. We have no idea. Hopefully we'll find him next week. But I do have Matt with me. How's it going? Uh, you know, life is uh, always fun and whatnot, Wendy. <laughs> <laughs> life is life. <laughs> As we were talking about some stuff that's going on uh, outside of tech and Linux and everything else. So yeah, fun times with uh, all that. But, you know, I'm here. Uh, <laughs> somehow I managed to get here, even though I didn't think I was going to be. You're surviving. Yeah, I know. I was kind of surprised when you showed up and I was like, wait a minute. You said you weren't coming today, but it worked out. <laughs> it did work out. As far as where Nate is, he's probably lost like a tumbleweed playing with OpenSUSE. In OpenSUSE land, yeah. yeah. Maybe he got sucked into his computer. It's his version of Jumanji, but if that's the case, we may never see him again because I don't think he'll want to leave. Well, it's kind of like Tron. You know, he plays so much with OpenSUSE <laughs> and stuff. Like maybe he did get sucked into the game with it, you know. Maybe. I wouldn't put it past him. And I mean Tron, not Tron Legacy. Uh <laughs> <laughs> Which was the game of the week last week. Anything else you've been up to this week? Anything fun? <sighs> Unfortunately, not as much as I would like to have been. It's just been a hectic week and not a lot of time to do a lot of the stuff that I wanted to do. So, I mean, I got some time to play some different video games and stuff, but not like really do what I like to do, which is like mess around with tech and all the other stuff. Unfortunately, just yeah. life has been super hectic and busy as far as just like, you know, professionally and stuff. So been a little hard, but other than that, um, still running windows on that laptop, which every time I use it makes me want to open a window <laughs> and I don't mean the OS. I mean, open a window. So there is that. That's uh, about <laughs> the best I can say, and uh, how many more days do I got? As of recording, I still have uh, one, two, three, four, five. Six. <laughs> I still have like eleven days. Uh, You're getting there. It's better than it was last time we talked. So hopefully, pretty soon, you'll be able to throw something new on it. What did you say you were going to put on that one again? Honestly, that is probably going to be Garuda, just because it's what I use. <laughs> At this point, right. honestly, when I get the two in one, which has yet still the ship, but that's for a variety of reasons, mm -hmm. that one is probably going to be either Ubuntu Unity or Ubuntu Budgie because of the touch screen scaling factor, and right? the scale. Yeah. Well, Unity specifically is more for the scaling factor. If I'm, I'm going to try both to see which one plays better with the hardware. Again, Unity has better scaling on those super high res screens. I'm not sure how Garuda with Plasma will play on a 4K screen when I do install it on that machine. So I guess I'll find out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I do have a 4K screen with Garuda on it, but I actually have the screen downscaled to 1080p because the other monitor that I'm using is 1080p and I don't like going from one that's 4K to mm -hmm. 1080p. Which, I mean, it's fine. Everything still looks nice and crisp and clear. Basically, it's making stuff not like itty-bitty all over this 32-inch screen. Makes it larger, a little bit more mm -hmm. comfortable, easier to use that way. And it's worked out fine, but you're using a much smaller screen, which can make things a little bit more difficult. 16-inch screen. Yeah. Like I said, it all depends on how Plasma's like global scaling works now on those super high res screens. So I think because it's a NVIDIA card, I'm assuming it's probably going to default to X. So I'm not super sure how well that's going to play with that. Yeah. <laughs> so are you going to go ahead and maybe throw Garuda on there first or maybe take one of the live USBs, play with it a little bit and kind of see, or just go right out of the box with Unity? I'm probably going to see how, as far as the NVIDIA machine, that's probably going to, I'm not going to do the square peg round hole approach. This is never how I do technology. Right, yeah. But if that doesn't work on that particular machine because it's NVIDIA specifically, 
I'm probably either going to put for the graphic switching that's built in either Pop! OS or Ubuntu Budgie because they have that baked mm. into the switching. I don't know about default yeah. Ubuntu because I haven't touched default Ubuntu forever. And it's nothing right. against Ubuntu. It's just I don't enjoy GNOME as an overall built upon DE, which is weird, even though I guess I know Unity and Budgie are all GDK based DEs. I'm not unaware of the irony there. But it's the way that they've taken that and done something different with it, right? Is yeah. what you enjoy about it, the way that it's worked in that code, not mm-hmm. necessarily the underlying code itself, but what they've done with the desktop environment period. Yeah, 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 exactly. It's budgy to me is the way I view what GNOME should be, personally. It's not a plasma as far as like you can tweak and do everything under the sun to it. It's got a, enough <laughs> customization to it that it doesn't feel as limiting as like a general GNOME or vanilla GNOME experience for me right that's where i'm coming from when it comes to that and as far as the two-in-one that again that's either going to be ubuntu budgie or unity solely for the more of the ui overall and scaling i don't know we'll figure it out and see how it goes and worst comes to worst i'll try some live usbs and you know go that route unfortunately as much as i love live usbs even though sometimes when you use them it doesn't always the end result is not always the same that is very very true sometimes you're like yeah the live usb worked great everything's fine and then you go to install and you're like wait a minute that's not what i expected exactly (laughs) certain things that i can expect from you though wendy is uh 3d printing apparently yeah and this is something that would probably be more fun to talk about with Nate, <laughs> but I'm going to let you take a nap right here while I tell everybody else in the audience about my latest 3D printing adventures. So now that robotics was done, I finally got my big tree tech Octopus Max EZ board all put together and then went to flash the firmware to the board and nothing was happening. So I was reading back through the user's manual and it said that there's a status light on the board and it should blink as stuff is getting flashed and it wasn't. And I went back and I had from the very beginning, because last time I was flashing a clipper to a main board, I had to use that original drive that came with my printer. Mm -hmm. So I was using that original, not drive, SD card. I was using that original SD card. It is an eight gigabyte card, but the instructions say, hey, format it as four gigs. I'd done all that. It wasn't flashing. I was just getting the one light. And then I was looking at the other part of the board. So on this board, there's three lights in the one corner. One's for 12 volt, one's for five volt, and one's for three and the 12 volt was red there was no light at all on 5 volt and then the 3 volt was red and i'm like hmm something isn't right with that and one of the downsides about the user's manual is it doesn't tell you what things should be lit up but as i was going through reading different forms and stuff the 12 and 5 were supposed to at least be green at for boards that were working anyway for other people and it was past like just a couple days past the day to send the board back to Amazon but I got things worked out because that was the first time I actually got to use it yeah I'd had the board for like a month but I had bought it as we were still getting ready for worlds going to worlds and I came home sick all of that stuff so really my first chance to use that board was Mother's Day weekend And yeah, I was pretty frustrated. It wasn't working. And it was like, you know, I right now just want a working printer. I don't care. And I rewired everything back up to that original board that my Ender 5 Plus came with. And everything's working fine. Yeah, I did have to go through relevel my bed. I did update the version of Marlin 1 that's on it. This is only an 8-bit board. So it will not take Marlin 2 very well. And in doing some other digging and stuff, there's just enough other lines of code inside that firmware that it bogs down that 8-bit board. You really need the 32-bit in order to 
run Marlin, do it successfully, have quality prints. So my 3D printer is working. I have finished several prints on it. I actually have a print running on it right now. The kids are using their VR headset and the original stand that I had printed for that broke, but I printed it out of PLA. That headset is pretty heavy and it's just not made to take the weight of that headset. So I've got another version of that stand for their Vive printing right now. And one thing I know for sure is I miss the silent board. <laughs> when my printer was using the SKR Mini, even though I struggled with it, like I loved those drivers are so much quieter. And I didn't understand why in the world is this original board so loud and some of these other boards not. And apparently it comes down to coil wine. So as they're either on or off and we've got heat as it's being used and then not used, that's what's calling, that's what's causing that coil wine. And in some of these other silent boards using other drivers, there's more of a taper on and off of those motor drivers. And that makes the difference between silent and not silent. So I definitely want the silent board again. Right now, the 3D printer is just outside of my bedroom. So while it's not as loud as if it was in here, it's definitely still kind of annoying. And I want the silent board back. And I miss Clipper. Like, I truly, truly miss Clipper. Marlin's up. It's working. I'm achieving prints. And Octoprint is nice, but there are so many features of Clipper that I got used to. A, hey, I need to make a change in the configuration file. All that takes is a reboot. Um, some of the other things that I miss is having status of what the temperature is on several boards, including the Raspberry Pi. Maybe these are some of the different plugins that can go into Octoprint. But I just really enjoy Fluid. I really like Clipper. I like the flexibility that it gave me and I want that back, but I'm kind of stuck. So if I go with the Ender 5 Plus upgraded silent board, that one is best if it sticks with Marlin. But I haven't had any problems with the original board straight from Creality. I could do the Creality version 4.2.7 silent board which would work all right but I think it can only take five motors maybe it can take six I know the upgraded Ender 5 plus board does have the ability to do two extruders and I want eventually two extruders on this there's the big tree tech Manta which is a pretty awesome control board this one at least the M8P can hold up to eight motors, which I think is pretty cool. There's a lot of flexibility with that board. And one of the things about the Mantas, because I've got two different Mantas that I'm looking at, is instead of having your Raspberry Pi separate, you end up having both of those things on the same board, which is nice because the power you're having in is all coming from one place. There isn't that extra cable that's connecting the two separate boards. It's kind of an all-in-one package. There's also the Manta E3 Easy. I already have five of the Easy 2209 drivers from the last board that I had that ended up not working properly, having something wrong on the power flow side of things. And yes, I did check the fuses. We checked the fuses. They were fine. That definitely wasn't the issue. So I do have those drivers already. And if I go with the easy board, then, well, I can use drivers that I already have. Whereas if I go with the Manta M8, I have to buy different drivers that are not the easy drivers. But the Manta E3 with the easy drivers only has five motor inputs. So if I decide that I want to or I'm ready to do that second extruder, well, I'm going to have to change boards again. There's the SKR Mini E3, which I had before. Originally, it fits into my case already, that one that came with the 3D printer. 
And that's nice because then everything's all together. I don't have to worry about figuring out, printing a new case. It all just works. But it's the same problem as the Manta E3. It only will take up to five motors. So when I'm ready for that second extruder, once again, that main board has to be upgraded. And then there is the Big Tree Tech Octopus Maxi Z, which is the last board that I had. The one that I had faulty power issues with. And maybe it's me. Maybe I did something wrong. I, I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. It could be me. But I loved that board for several different reasons. Right now, on the board that I have, and a lot of the ones that are options here, you have to use a daughter board to route that power through for the hotbed. And on the Maxi Z, you don't have to do that. The motors end up getting their own power input. The bed has its own power in and power out directly on the main board. I love the fact that you can set the voltage on the fans so you don't have to use 5 volt fans. You can use 12 volt fans. It gives you more options that way, being able to use some larger fans in different parts of the board. And then you have room for 10 different motors. Now, on a 3D printer, am I going to use that many motors? Absolutely not. I think the max that I would use is six. Something like this, I think, would work really cool for a homemade CNC. I'm worried about buying another Big Tree Tech board where I've had issues with the last two. Granted, this time I don't have robotics going on, so I could purchase the board, use it, and then send it back if it doesn't work. But then I've got to rewire the gosh dang thing all over again. I don't know. I don't know where I want to go. I know that I'm not a huge fan of Marlin. I know I want the silent motors. I know I want fluid back, but I just can't make up my mind as to which controller board to get because I've been burned by the last two that I've tried to bring on. And that's kind of where I'm stuck. I've got the refund back from my last board and the money's just right now sitting on my Amazon account where I try to figure out what in the world I'm going to do next. It's always fun with the adventures in 3D printing for you one day, it seems like. Uh, <laughs> you're always tweaking or doing something a little bit different with your board or trying to get something a little more out of what you originally had out of the reality. Yeah, and I think that's one of the fun things about 3D printers, especially the line that I've got right here is you can tweak and upgrade and change. The direct drive extruder that I put on it from Micro Swiss is running absolutely fantastic. One of the things that I don't like about that upgrade is there's actually a piece of Bowden tube that runs a very short distance from the bottom of where those gears are into the top of that all metal hot end. And the issue is when you are putting new filament into it, trying to get that filament to line up properly into that little piece of Bowden tube is an absolute ripping pain in the rear end. But other than that, I am really, really enjoying that hot end. It's doing a fantastic job. Apparently I put it together properly because it's printing fantastic. So it's now like, how do I get the main board that I want running the firmware that I want? And then I can stop messing with it for a little bit until I'm ready to put that second extruder on it. Until the next time you decide to change something. Right, right, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. That's what I thought. I was going to say, you mess around with the 3D printer, I think, more than Nate does. Visit linode.com slash tux and see why over a million developers trust Linode for their infrastructure. From their award-winning support to ease of use and setup, it is clear why developers and businesses have been trusting Linode for their projects, both big and small, since 2003. Don't worry if you're just getting started. That 24-hour, 7 days a week, 365 days a year support is offered to every level of user. They also offer industry best price to performance value for all compute instances, including shared, dedicated, high memory, and GPUs. Linode makes cloud computing simple, affordable, and accessible 
allowing you to focus on your customers, not your infrastructure. Visit linode.com slash tux, create a free account, and you'll get a $100 credit. Say you're in a hurry. Don't worry about it. You can build everything yourself or use the Linode one-click apps to deploy everything from Plesk, WordPress, to Valheim and Minecraft servers. Make sure you visit Linode slash Tux to get started for free and snag that $100 credit while you're at it. We've talked a lot about why we enjoy Plasma. We've talked about different things on applications that we use in our different workflows. But one thing we haven't talked about is very, very specific workflows, how we do them, different things that we install in order to make that work. I, everyone knows that I use a dark theme. I think everyone on this show uses a dark theme, but that's not the end to a Linux workflow. Before we actually got started in recording that, you had some really interesting things to say on how you use your system. And I can't wait to hear more about this. My workflow when it comes to specifically Plasma is a little bit different than most people. It's because I used Unity for a really long time. I used it even a, for a while after they officially killed it. A lot of my workflow is everything to the left. The nice thing with Plasma that it allows me to do is specifically because I use Garuda, I'll leave the minimize, maximize, close buttons where they are, but I will swap out the menu and use one called Kiki Q because it's a full screen. Well, not full screen, but a full quarter screen. So vertically top to bottom, it uses the full height of the panel. So it just looks more symmetrical for me. It's a looks thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm weird when it comes to aesthetics. Not Rocco weird where it's like a pixel off, but like, you know, just enough still. I'll move everything to the left and use that. I do that simply because of how I transition from application to application. Um, Unity was very much a full screen application kind of approach. So that's how I just use applications generically. So what I do is I'll say be in one application, I get done with it, I'll close it out. Then I can just shortly move my mouse over to the menu button, hit that, go right into the next application I need. Because the, instead of doing what most people would do, I have the favorites loaded up in a certain way that I constantly just keep reusing. So it's a nice little feature. I do keep the bottom latte dock that Garuda ships with. Really don't use it a whole lot. It's more kind of just there. I move where Garuda would have the overview from the left. I move that to the right side because obviously wouldn't be moving everything to the left kind of <laughs> that'll make things awkward. What I also do is there's a nice little feature. And now I believe Nate, you could probably speak to this more than me. Wait, what? Nate's back? Holy oh, hi crap. There. He just jumped back out of his computer. <laughs> yeah. Well, you start talking like OpenSUSE and Unity, and I wasn't sure whether to come out of the shell or not. Well, thank you. You did. I was going to ask you, Matt, mm -hmm. this one called Unity Evolution Global Theme that has a lot of things all pre-set up, or did you do this unwieldy mess yourself? I did this unwieldy mess myself. A lot of it's just <laughs> simple tweaks. They're not really, really, actually really that in depth because of the way Garuda is set up. Wendy, you can speak to that more than anybody because, you know, Nate doesn't touch Arch with a 10-foot pole. If, <laughs> yeah. Unless it comes on his Steam Deck. Right. I just kind of suffer through it on the Steam Deck just because the Steam Deck is so good. <laughs> It's because it doesn't use the AUR. It's one of the things I don't like about Garuda is a lot of things start out on the left and it doesn't feel right to me. So I'm sure that helps you out from mm -hmm. the very beginning where everything's already on the left. That means that there is less that you need to adjust, even though you do do quite a few tweaks from the sounds of it in order to finish getting things in the workflow that you want. That's one thing that you don't have to change. And it's one of the things that I change immediately is moving <laughs> those things back to the right. <laughs> it really is a personal preference thing. Like right. to me, that is legitimately what like a workflow means. It's like, it's just how you interact with the flow from one application to another and work within that flow is like how I view a workflow. Everyone's got a different way. They want to probably look at that. But another thing, uh, that for me, I know, again, Nate, you'll probably be able to speak to this because you use more default plasma stuff than I do because I grew to ships with latte doc for everything. So 
in latte doc there's this thing that for applications that are very much in the vein of like the old style of like the multiple windows one application like the old gimp style um for that there's allow group applicant like you can group all those windows as one icon in the dock okay. yeah when i do editing i use Cinelera. Cinelera is very much a four window application having that all in one icon when you can minimize maximize it all at once is amazing <laughs> and one that i use all the time for me that definitely helps with that and kind of keeps a workflow easier for me to like grasp as opposed to like alt tabbing through 17 different windows with one application. So those are just right. some things that I use. Auto hide is one for that I use for the task panel. I'm more about clean interfaces. I don't use desktop icons. Yeah. I'm really fussy when it comes to certain aesthetical things. So I'm also the weird one that uses the GUI out of the three of us. So, you know, whatever. (laughs) You are weird. I'm not saying that there isn't something wrong with clean interfaces because I totally understand what you mean there. I've talked multiple times about how I like my phone set up. I don't like a bunch of apps on the front. And I typically theme the crap out of my phone. So it's not even the standard icons on the bottom. Mm -hmm. Because I want it to have a flow. I want to be able to find specific things that I need and otherwise not. And while having applications on the desktop can be really handy for someone as far as their workflow, being able to see, hey, this is what I'm doing next. This is what I want to open. I find it so much easier to hit the meta key, type out what I want and open it instead of going and clicking on it on the desktop. And that is really fantastic is you can interact with these desktops regardless of whether it's GNOME, Plasma, any of the others that we've talked about recently. And we've actually talked about desktops quite a bit. You have that option of interacting with it more on the keyboard side or interacting with it more on the mouse side. Definitely. But I'm more curious because, Wendy, you definitely, I'm assuming, have a very different workflow than what mine would probably be (laughs) from the sounds of it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. If I am starting up Manjaro from the beginning, there's really not a whole lot of things that I change. It does have a basic light dark theme that it comes with, and I need everything dark. And like you, I don't have images as my background. I don't have applications on my window. And so I will open up after I change the theme on it. So it's all dark. Then I'll typically open up the file browser, use the color picker so that I have a color of my background that matches the same windows and stuff that I'll be opening. So not the lighter borders, but the darker part of it on the inside of it. So it flows really well, has a nice overall theming. For the most part, most of my workflow is centered around having multiple screens. So I have two 32-inch monitors, and I have multiple windows open at the same time. So right now, I have Firefox full screen on my main desktop, I have Discord on a smaller format on my left-hand screen plus Tenacity that I am recording into so I can see everything that's going on. Now, say I am editing Linux out loud. For the most part, I only need one window open during that process, during the actual editing. It's when it's time to upload that, do the show notes and everything, that I've got multiple windows going on at the same time. So Tenacity is open in the beginning because as I'm editing, I am marking my timestamps. Sometimes it's a little bit of mess. If you're looking at the labels track underneath it, but I have all of that marked out. So first thing I do is I'm going into, of course, Firefox using Fireside and copying most of that over from the previous week and then using those timestamps in order to mark where that is. From there, I have at the same time, I'm typically listening back to the episode. So I have a window open for that one. That one doesn't necessarily need to be up, but I am keeping an eye on the video 
render portion of it. So if you've ever quote unquote seen the show on YouTube, yeah, you don't get to see our smiling faces, but you are watching that waveform or you can watch that waveform if you want to. And that is all done with Bash. So when I start that process in the terminal, I want to keep an eye on it because as soon as it's done, I also want to start that uploading. As we've talked about before, I am on slow country internet. So I have multiple windows open on my screens as I'm running through things because I need things from those different screens. I typically end up with at least two windows of Firefox open at the same time because I need something from this page that I'm just copying over to that page. And instead of flipping tabs, I prefer to have different windows open. And most of those extra windows are on the screen to my right. I would love it if I also had a third screen to my left. I think that's as far as my workspace, one of the next upgrades going to be so that my other windows aren't quite so small on that right hand screen. But most of my workflow centers around being able to have one screen that I'm focused on, but other smaller versions of those around me. And I know people can achieve some of that with those virtual desktops. And I've used that in the past if I'm doing two different things at the same time. So this desktop has say I'm editing on it and the other desktop has fun stuff going on with games that you're playing or, or whatnot, being able to separate that workout. I have done that in the past, but anymore, not quite as much. Oh, I guess I do have two windows opening when I'm editing. And this is thanks to my ADD is I will have the show open on my main screen, but I'll typically have a video going on my right hand screen it's typically turned down really, really low, but I found that I get more done. I'm more efficient if when I have a scroll movement, that scroll can be like, oh, I'm paying attention to something that was going on in that video and my brain back to work. Instead of, see, I just had a scroll there as I remembered how I did that workflow. Instead of me having a squirrel going down a rabbit hole for an hour and a half and going, oh crap, I still have a show to edit. Hmm, I should probably get on that. <laughs> Like when you ask yourself, how many pounds of milk does it require to make a pound of cheese? Right. Yeah. You know, just random squirrels like that. Uh -huh. Yeah, I understand. Most definitely. Yes. It keeps <laughs> my squirrels in order. It keeps them going down certain tracks so I get my work done faster and more efficiently. Multiple screens, without a doubt, are one of the biggest parts of my Linux workflow and being able to have Windows in ordered in a fashion that allows me to do that. And one of the things that I love about Plasma, and it's probably like a broken record, is I can take the windows that I use, and especially if I need them in a certain size, can say, hey, I want you to show up on this screen in this size. I don't do that as much as I used to because those windows are changing in size depending on what position I am in that workflow process, especially for getting the show up because I'm bouncing back and forth as... Nate can attest when he was doing it. There's actually a lot more to the upload process of this show than it looks like just yep. from the back end of it. So I have lots of windows open during that time. Now, Nate, it is awesome to have you back and I'm super excited. I wish you would have been here for my 3D printer discussion. Bummer. We can talk about that later, I promise, because mm, Matt slept through it. Say what? <laughs> uh, I heard 3D printing and I fell asleep. Dozed off on you. <laughs> yeah. What do you expect from Matt? Not much. Nothing no. less. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing more. So I have a couple of different ways that I use my desktop. Depending on the system, they're all slightly different just because of the size and, and the orientation of the screens. My Commodore 64 imposter computer, I have an ultra wide screen on that one. So I have a lot of screen to look at. And this one, I only use two virtual desktops. But as far as like plasma stuff, it's pretty close to the standard. I do shift some things around. I do add a few things so I can like monitor like CPU usage and whatnot. I changed the theme to be my own OpenSUSE breeze dark look. I published actually, so you can, you can download that from the KDE looks. What I tend to do on this machine is I have things set up you know, using tiling. So I, I tile stuff in different corners. The show notes I have tiled to one side of the screen. 
the Audacity recording is in like the lower right hand side and then Discord is above that. This makes it really easy for me to move things around, you know, if I need to say something obnoxious to Matt in the chat while we're talking or whatever, I can do that very easily and still keep my eye on the show notes. But it's actually a fairly, fairly vanilla plasma setup. I do like that OpenSUSE just has a very pleasant background. Like I just like it's very engineering looking and that makes me happy. So I don't have to change that. And then I just changed the sound effects to instead of the KDE default sound effects, I change them to all these Star Trek sound effects, specifically Star Trek The Next Generation computer sounds. I've been using them now for like almost 20 years on the computer. I wish I could say that I am surprised that you change things to Star Trek sounds, but you shouldn't I'm not. Be. <laughs> shouldn't be yeah actually i toned them down i used to do more effects but i'd scale a lot of it back i would have sounds for like maximize minimize and restore and all that stuff but i, I don't do that anymore just for events so I'll, you know when, when something happens i just want to be notified more notification sounds instead of everything sounds right pretty much also i do have sound effects for like when i actually logs onto the network as well for the laptop not, not for the desktop the laptop i use differently so i have a stack if I'm sitting somewhere at the computer, like if it's not on my lap, I have a, a stacked desktop, like stacked screens. So I move things up and down. It's really nice for editing. Or if I'm working on, you know, Linux Saloon and I'm editing it, I'm working on the timestamps at the same time and going through the show notes so I can try and be more efficient. And that's very nice. Generally, I render on the more powerful computer. Everything is nicely synchronized. That one, if I'm in a laptop mode, then I'm very virtual desktop heavy. And I, I'll switch from virtual desktop to virtual desktop. So that one has, I have four virtual desktops and then based on the kind of work i'm doing will dictate i'll segregate them into all their virtual desktops and that allows me to move very easily from one to another and so when i do have a squirrel moment it's i'm squirreling hopefully not to go find out how many pounds of milk does make a pound of cheese but instead i'm jumping into you know one of the other hustles or my job activities instead and for the most part that works quite well I don't like uh, the, any bar on the top. So I know, Matt, you see like the Unity thing, Unity look, but I don't like anything at the top of my screen, be the top of the windows or what I'm working on. I have the panel on the bottom, the, dish, the default panel. I don't have a, the extra, what would normally be across the top for the Unity bar. Oh, okay. I just moved the default panel that ships to the left. Oh, okay. I got gotcha. you. What would be the like, quote unquote dash on the side is just the KD plasma panel or latte doc panel whatever i got you so and also i use the icons only task manager because i just find that to be just a little bit cleaner i think it just it doesn't fill up the bottom bar and i don't have anything centered i have stuff like right justified and left justified depending on what it is i like my menu my little open susa logo in the lower left hand side you know as is customary on windows systems of old that's actually pretty much it i make it so it's a dark theme I add a widget to show me the CPU load because sometimes something happens and I'll work on something and you know it'll peg out and I want to make sure I can address it immediately. That's really it. The virtual desktops are great for multitasking because I think it's sometimes you can have things set up better from one screen to another, one virtual desktop to another. I don't really have to do a whole lot to make it work well for me. And again, depending on the system and how I'm using it, you know, if it's if I'm going in laptop mode, sitting on my lap, that's different than in a, a desktop mode, I guess, with it, if that makes any sense. Different form factor of machine, so right. a different workflow to go with a different form factor, yeah. Exactly. I really appreciate how flexible Plasma is that just allows me to do that just so easily. That's something right there. It is incredibly handy if you have different workflows that you want to adjust and I'm sure there are some out-of-the-box experiences on some of these other desktops and the ways that you can tweak them to make them work. I know when I was a GNOME user there for a little bit, I had certain extensions that I would add in order to get the usefulness that I needed out of my system. One of those a long time ago was an app called Caffeine because when my screen was full screened on a video or something else like that going on, I didn't want it to automatically go to sleep. I don't know if that's still required since it's been so long since I've used GNOME myself, but it was part of that, hey, this is how I use my computer setup that I needed to have in there. Right now, of course, that's all covered by Plasma. It's one of the reasons why it took me a little bit to transition to Plasma because they didn't have that for a little bit. But now that's built in and it's no longer an issue. I know I do absolutely love that bar at the bottom, taskbar, whatever you want to call it, because I am using 
those different adjustments in there. I need to make tweaks for my system. I do have core control that drops down into that bar. So when my computer starts up, it goes into the fan curve that I need, but I can click on that, bring up the application. It's time to record, switch that to the recording profile. It gets minimized back down into that taskbar and I use it in order to mute my microphone so that I don't have to do it from Discord. It is a system-wide mute, so it's not showing up in Discord. It's not showing up in my Tenacity recording. Everything is nice and silent in those different areas. It is something that I use quite a bit, and one reason that I stick with the desktop environment that I do, because it is important to my using my computer every single day. It is an important feature for me that I don't want to get rid of. Oh yeah, that's a good point. The uh, hotkey shortcuts are different from computer to computer as well, because the keyboard yes. layouts are slightly different. Like on my Commodore 64 Imposter, my key sequence to kill the microphone, because I use it all the time, so I can cough or sneeze like unlike Matt who just leaves his mic just blazing on while he's <laughs> moving furniture in the background I if I'm going to move some furniture which I'm not going to do I just have a quick hotkey this the control the meta key and then the, the volume down because just the way out of the keyboard is laid out it's just it's a perfect way to do that and I can do it very very quickly and seamlessly and yeah that'll kill it system wide now for my laptop I actually have a key a hotkey that's you know built in a media key for muting the microphone. And so that's all I have to do for that machine. But truth be told, I actually like my custom way better than that. I'm oh, sorry, Nate. Were you talking? I kind of stopped paying attention. I know you're probably <laughs> moving your love seat to the other side of your office there, I'm sure. Getting ready to play some of your anime games. No, I just heard you starting to talk and like my ears just automatically closed. There must be like, you know, a, a key combination. Oh, Nate talking. That's the key combination. Yes, it's true. Matt hides nothing from us, though, during recording. Like we can hear every mic slam, setting our drinks down on the table, everything. Yeah, he doesn't hide anything. Matt's nope. very open. Completely unveiled. <laughs> the nice thing about Plasma, and I'm sure other, other desktops that do that too, is how you can customize your interface to match your hardware and making little tweaks too. A downside to this keyboard layout is it's not real convenient to change virtual desktops. It's not as convenient with the default key combination because the function keys are being shared with the number of keys in the top row mm -hmm. just because of the way the keyboard is. So rather than pick a two-handed operation to, to shift the virtual desktops, I set up a custom key combination to make that happen. And it works great. I can switch between computer to computer, no problem, because it is it is done in such a way that it makes sense for me. There's little bits of customization, you know, between the visual tweaks, how you want your applications laid out to match the hardware is so valuable. Do you use your computer the same way we do or one of us does? Or do you have some completely different workflow with some awesome applications out there that can make it that much better? Please share with us. We can't wait to hear from you. This episode of Linux Out Loud is sponsored by Bitwarden. Bitwarden is the password manager that we use and trust. Bitwarden lets you set up things like a pin to easily access your password manager as well as additional authentications, such as master passwords and adding phrases to fingerprint security, all to keep your passwords safe. Bitwarden is the easiest and safest way for teams, individuals, and businesses to store, share, and sync their sensitive data. Go to bitwarden.com slash tux to get started for free. Say you want that premium account. It starts at just $10 per year. What comes with that? One gigabyte of encrypted file storage, two-step login with YubiKey, U2F, and Duo, Vault Health Reports, TOTP authenticator storage and generation plus priority customer support. Make the smart move like many in the community have and go to bitwarden.com slash tux to get started for free. If you're like me though, you'll want to show your appreciation for this amazing open source project by signing up for the premium edition, especially where it starts at just $10 per year. Thanks to Bitwarden for sponsoring this episode of Linux Out Loud.
Well, we're so glad to have you back out of your computer, but you're not done with OpenSUSE because you have a special install to talk about this week. I do. My new job that I have, I am at this point kind of sort of forced to use a Windows machine. It is a very Microsoft heavy place. I don't know if I'll be able to change it. There are some very nice conveniences that come along with that. Not going to lie. I'll give the devil his due on that one. But the problem is it just feels so restrictive and unfun. So I started the process of learning how do you install WSL, Windows Subsystem for Linux, a Windows machine. It's a Windows 11 machine. Oh, and by the way, I feel like I'm just constantly being bombarded with advertisements on Windows 11. It's it's really pretty um, disconcerting. That aside, it was pretty trivial to install Windows Subsystem for Linux and the distribution of, of choice. And one of the default options was, hear this, OpenSUSE Tumbleweed. So I did indeed install that. It all went very well. You had to like reboot the machine to make it work. But it's now just a menu item. I can launch OpenSUSE Tumbleweed. But at this point, I'm just playing with it in the terminal. I don't know enough to know about the graphical tools. So there'll be a part two to this. But at this time, it just having the terminal, having Bash and all the fun little bits and pieces of uh, Linux in the terminal, which Matt wouldn't understand because he doesn't even know what terminal is. But it was fun to have that and to play with it, getting the different YAS tools and, and so forth. So that's as far as I've gotten with it. There's a little bit of excitement now. I, I don't dread using that laptop as much because I have you know, WSL plus OpenSUSE Tumbleweed. So I think it's just something I'm going to continue to explore and see if maybe I can add a few other things that'll make a little creature comforts on that Windows system. So what are you currently using WSL for on this Windows 11 system? Just to play and get away. <laughs> it's your escape from the rest of... Yeah. The software. Yep. Yep. It's like a little refuge in the computer. So I'm not doing a lot with it yet. I just installed it yesterday and haven't really had time to really fully explore and, and play with it. But it's an automatic script, essentially, that installs all the basic bits and pieces of Tumbleweed right into the system. Nate, what is this command line you speak of? I know. So you do it in PowerShell, which PowerShell is way nicer than the DOS command prompt. Like WSL install and then OpenSUSE hyphen Tumbleweed, basically. There's some dashes in there as well. But I'm documenting the process I'm using to do that just so I can hopefully put together a nice little article on cubicle8.com for um, making Windows a slightly happier place. Not going to lie, having to be forced to use Windows for the last three weeks, I don't think it's possible anymore. <laughs> Listen, I said slightly happier. <laughs> Better than nothing anyway. Right, exactly. Well, Matt, you have got another game of the week, and I'm glad you've actually been doing these games of the week. I'm glad that you're doing these because it's nice to see like a little peek behind the curtain of what interests Matt. Actually, Nate, you will appreciate the game because it's based on, well, it's actually based on the movies, which is a satirical look at the book. So I guess if you want to go that route. The game is called Starship Troopers Extermination, essentially a asymmetrical shooter. So it's a team based shooter. I believe it's 32 players. I could be wrong on the exact amount. That's a lot of players. Yeah. It's a PV, what they call PVE or player versus environment. So anybody who knows what Starship Troopers is, it's arachnids and all the other stuff. It's literally giant spiders that are trying to kill you. That is the entire concept. Yay. But this has base building. It has uh, ground combat, team combat. But what I really like about this. You forgot the bug obliterating. You didn't say anything about that. <laughs> I was getting there. Oh, okay. Sorry. I, I didn't mean to steal your thunder. <laughs> the thing that I really like about this game, though, is besides the fact that it is literally shooting all the giant bugs from the Starship Troopers movies and various iterations that have come across in time is that it is a great community around it. I was in a team that wanted literally somebody had not gone through the tutorial, obviously, because the guy was like, how do I build stuff? And mm -hmm. there was no, why didn't you play the tutorial? There was no, like, I hate the term toxic, but no unfriendly response. It was a very... Oh, no, good. hey, RTFM, you dummy. Yeah. <laughs> there was no arch <laughs> response. Let's put it that way. Uh -huh. yeah. I like that. I did definitely did like seeing that because it was very cordial and very like, hey, let's do this. And that team atmosphere, which is really cool. But it is an early access game that uses easy anti-cheat. But guess what? Worked day one on Linux. Nice. I see really? this is not only new, it is brand spanking new it dropped on may 17th so week of recording it mm -hmm. dropped just a couple days ago yeah i was able to get a uh review code for it so uh nice. i've been 
playing that on my personal channel and uh there, there's about a 45 minute stream of it so I, there's really not a lot of commentary um i was more just focusing on the gameplay and seeing how that pans out but there's base building there's different classes and stuff different weapons to unlock it's an early access title so do keep that in mind bit buggy one of the things I didn't notice when it comes to specifically, it could be a Linux issue or a Proton issue. I don't know. Weirdly enough, I was playing this on the AMD system that I had, but I had to mm. enable the Intel. I think it's whatever their version of essentially like what DLSS is, like the AI enhancing stuff for better frame oh, okay. rates. I had to enable that on my AMD card for like a more stable frame rate. That was the only thing that I've noticed. Again, could just be because it's a Linux Proton thing. I haven't tried it on Windows, so I um, I don't plan on it because I plan it. Uh, we talked about that earlier, Wendy. Um, mm -hmm. I, I plan yes. on nuking and paving that system shortly. So that is kind of the game of the week as far as this. So if you want a decent multiplayer game that is on Linux, that yes, it uses the easy anti-cheat. There was an update to EAC not that long ago on Linux. It allows you to play this day one. I believe it's either $25 or $30. I don't remember off the top of my head. $25 according to Steam. But as an early access title with a really good community, I think it is definitely worth plugging as a game for specifically Linux people that are looking for a game for multiplayer games that work on their system. When certain other companies, like I'm looking at you, uh, Bungie with Destiny 2, and we're gonna ban you if you try that. So, mm. here's a better yeah. game. <laughs> yeah. I didn't see on here where it says it's friendly to the Steam Deck, though. Gaming on Linux has a something up for the, the Steam Deck. I haven't tried it on the Deck yet, so I was just trying it on the main system. Oh, okay. I got you. I'm picking up what you're laying down. I cannot speak to that. Based on what it says here on the Steam store, it says there's only partial controller support. So I don't know how well it would work on your Steam Deck right now. I'm not going to lie. It is a very, I don't want to call it awkward, very uh, finger gymnastic type of uh, keyboard usage. If you're not going to use a lot of the keyboard, you're not going to enjoy this game at all. Again, I don't know how it will translate to controllers, so I haven't tried it. It's been mouse and keyboard for me. That's just how I generically play those specific type of games, barring, I think, Warframe. Oh, it says I have one friend that already owns this game. Huh. Who would that friend be? Couldn't be Matt. It says Matt TDN. <laughs> uh, he's no friend. I don't remember adding you on Steam. Oh, you definitely have because, what was it? Not last week. Maybe it was last week. I know recently... You threatened him with looking at what his was in his Steam library to see if he had bought the game or not that you suggested. Touche. I feign <laughs> ignorance here. I still don't remember adding him. It must have been somebody else. <laughs> he just magically showed up in your friend's list. Well, kind of like yep. he magically showed up back in the show. You know, he just well, decided. Well, I guess that's true. Yeah. He decided to emerge back from his Tron enabled open Sousa tumbleweed machine. Nate, were the light cycles all green? Yes, they were. Every one of them. You couldn't tell your friends from your foes. Oh, so it was more like Tron Legacy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the movie, not the game. Well, I don't know what, what Robert Heinlein would say about this game, but I think it looks pretty cool. And then again, I'm pretty sure Robert Heinlein would not like of what they did with the movie yeah, as a sidebar. Um, <laughs> nah, they kept a lot of the themes the same. They just it just was the military portion became very satire, a little bit watered down, perhaps. But yeah, no, I think this looks like a great game. It's a little bit new for me. I'll have to wait, you know, 20 years before I can download it. But you know, I'm, when I'm 60. 364, I'll, I'll give it a try. I thought you were already that old anyway. Ooh. Oh, snap. <laughs> it's like how old you are. Versus how old you feel. Yeah, it's how old I feel. I'm high mileage too. <laughs> so while I'm making game recommendations for multiplayer games, Wendy, you are have a game of the week yourself. And this time it is one where VR is in play. So that'll be interesting. Yes, it is. There are so many VR games out there that I can't play. And I've talked about it before. They cause some really serious eye strain. They make me dizzy, whatnot. And my kids, and I've actually seen this game before too, it's called Beat Saber. And the kids were really, really wanting this game. So I made a deal with them. If they went and cleaned out the fridge and found out what had died in there, 
<laughs> then I would get them this game. <laughs> And they jumped right on it. Fantastic. Yes. They fired it up yesterday for the very first time. And I was watching my daughter play. And I'm like, holy cow, this looks like a ton of fun. So I figured I'd go ahead and give it a try myself. Now, I am not very coordinated, uh, especially when it comes to gameplay. It's part of the reason why I don't play first-person shooter games. But I found this to be an absolute blast. Really got into the gameplay. So if you've never played it before... You have your two different sabers in each side of your hand. They can be different colors depending on the song that's coming up. And then you also have walls and other things that are coming at you. So right now I am stuck on easy mode, but they're definitely harder songs and you can go up in levels throughout the different songs. But this one didn't make me sick. It didn't cause eye strain. Very, very stable. So they've done fantastic work on the graphics and stuff in it. I wish they had just a little bit more song variety from the initial. You can buy more songs from it and they do have some additional packages of songs that you can get for it. So cost wise, I'd say it's definitely one of the steeper games, but without a doubt, it is a ton of fun. One of the songs that I was playing there were these walls coming at you. So there's some that you have to dodge left or right. And these ones were like right in front of you. And I was getting my squats in for the day, my air squats as I was up and down for the walls that I was trying to miss. So a lot of fun. I think it's one of the most interactive games. I definitely see us playing this a lot in the future. So we were just playing it solo, but you can play it as a party. I don't know if that you can pass your sabers back and forth or in a way that you're in competition with other people. That's probably a good possibility. Solo, it was a ton of fun. We'll check out some of the other options in the game, like the party mode and that kind of stuff. But even though the base price of this game is right around $30 and then you have music add-ons, I'd say for the quality of the graphics and the levels that you have that can be increased with it, it's definitely a good buy at full price. And I will be watching for sales on this in order to add to the music library of it. My daughter did add one of the Linkin Park songs yesterday almost immediately. Nice. I know, right? My daughter has good taste in music. She does. But so we'll add more music as time goes on. And you definitely can slowly do that. And I would like to add like some of the fuller, larger library packs just as they go on sale. But it is, it's a ton of fun. If you have a VR headset and don't have this one already, I'd say it's a great one to pick up. I've actually seen this game before. When I took my kids to an arcade here locally, this is one of the games they had there. So you had a VR headset you put on, and, and my boy liked it because it was, you know, lightsaber-ish sort yeah. of thing. And it looks like fun. The walls do look a little bit disconcerting <laughs> from flying at you. It was the one caught me off guard because it was like right center form. And you know that it's a fake wall, but when it hits you in the face, you're like, holy crap. <laughs> <laughs> That one was a song that I failed, by the way. The one that I got hit in the face of the wall. Yeah, I mean, it looks really cool, and it's probably a, a good workout, too, I suppose. It is, and it's great for coordination. It's one of those games that really makes you think, because not only are you supposed to hit it with the right color, it has arrows in which you're having to cut it at a specific direction. Oh, I didn't even pick up on that. Yeah, it's not just hitting it. The arrows that are on those blocks are actually telling you the direction. And where it gets a little bit more complicated, especially on some of the songs, is when you're not hitting, say, red and blue in the same direction. You're supposed to be cutting them in opposite directions and coming at you fast enough that you have to have the, oh, recognition of what I'm supposed to do. Of course, I think some of that just comes with practice and memorizing the songs in the order you're supposed to do it. But it is one that makes you get up. It makes you move. It makes you think. I honestly cannot wait to play it again. So this actually makes me think to myself, maybe I should invest in VR. You might love it. And I, I, I bought our headset used. You don't have to go and buy a new one. Ours is an older Vive that I picked up for a really good price on Swappa. 
you don't have to invest in a new VR headset. Some of the older ones are just as fantastic. Personally, I would recommend the Vive over anything from Oculus, or sorry, Meta, whatever they're calling it at the moment. Oculus. Yeah. Meta, yeah. I'm not going to buy anything that requires a Facebook account. Sorry. Yeah. Right. That was my point. I would also make that recommendation because as Wendy's mentioned that Vive seems to play nicer with Linux after some initial issues, obviously, but yeah, I know that you said ever since you went to Gruta, those are really not an issue anymore. Right. Originally when we'd set it up, of course, it was on my Manjaro system. I did have to install some additional drivers. There was the original Steam VR thing that needed to be added. It's kind of your interface for all of your VR games, so it needs to be started before your VR games. And VR still wasn't working, so I had to go into the AUR, install a few things, and then it was working fine. And we didn't use VR headset for quite a while. I We installed Garuda when they put this gaming system together, and it was like I mentioned before, just installed the Steam VR app, whatever it is, and VR with our HTC Vibe worked out of the box, no problems. And the kids have been off and playing with it. I highly recommend that one. We've got the, I think, the original Vive. I am seeing the HTC Vive Pro currently on Swappa for a decent price. So that might be a good one to pick up. I don't actually see the one that we have right now available on Swappa currently. But one thing that I love about Swappa is I'm less worried about getting crap that looks good like I am on eBay. Like, oh yeah, this looks fantastic and you get it and it's not exactly what it seems to be. I just feel that Swappa does a better job keeping track of that stuff and making sellers accountable for what they're selling. So that's why I personally choose to buy mine on there when the kids were looking for one, went that direction. Also, if you go with a Vive, just make sure you have plenty of room. (laughs) That's the biggest thing, just for the tracking. The way we have our setup right now is one of the trackers is kind of above that TV stand looking down, and then we have a bookshelf that's almost exactly opposite that in the room. Mm -hmm. So it's up pretty high on there also looking down. And that's one thing I've noticed that if they're up higher and looking down, it seems to be better tracking than equal levels on the lower levels. It's got a wider stretch of that. And because we have one front and back, we don't have some of those dead zones that we've had in the past. It seems to be pretty good at wherever you are in that living room space. Does a pretty good job tracking. I had reached a point where I was getting a little bit outside of that. I kind of had this mesh wall in front of me and I took a couple steps back and I was fine. I was out of that and it didn't affect my gameplay at all. So I would definitely go with the Vive. I think the Vive Pro, it's an updated version of the one we have And the one that's currently on there is like $50 more than what we paid for our older version. Yeah, and I'm going to have to look into it. Thanks a lot, Wendy. You're welcome. Between you and Matt, I don't know. I think I need friends that are more fiscally responsible. See, Matt (laughs) is the one that denies when he tells you to buy stuff or that he's an enabler. I am totally open about the fact (laughs) that I'm enabling you to buy the hardware, but I'm not saying go buy it new. Don't drop a thousand dollars on a headset. Absolutely not. Buy a used one that's in good shape. Yep, will do. I don't enable at all. I don't know what you're talking about. Liar. I'd say he has no class, but he's just end of his class. Nope. I'm not. I'm gonna be good. <laughs> you're not gonna go there. Nope. Gonna be good. Okay, fine. You are so boring sometimes. I mean that in the nicest possible way, by the way. Now it's your turn to toss in your two cents on today's topics. Hit the discourse form. Drop us a line under this video or the contact form by visiting tuxdigital.com slash contact. If you'd like to hang out with us on our preferred social media, see the links in the bottom of the show description. Find other great shows like Hard Radics, GameSphere, Linux Saloon, and more at tuxdigital.com. Show off your love for your favorite podcasts and shows by visiting the Tux Digital merch store. Grab yourself some awesome swag like the Gamer Centric I Paused My Game to Be Here shirt or... 
Join Team Wendy with some sinister Wendy swag. You're evil. As always, not evil, just a little grumpy sometimes. Get over it. Well, Matt plays games while we're trying to do this show, so I mean, come on. He doesn't even pause his game to be here. I know, right? <laughs> Only if you're talking about 3D printing. 3D printing or there's some other stuff that you tune out for. I think robotics. Yes, yes. He definitely tunes out for robotics. Basically, if it's really interesting... He tunes out. We lose Matt. Yeah. As always, we thank you for joining us. We'll be back next week with another awesome episode of Linux Out Loud. Until then, keep the banter friendly, conversation somewhat on topic, and have fun doing it. <laughs> <laughs>